I reset this up in my rough dimensions, and since I have an inch leeway, I set everything up at a half inch, so if it comes out undersized or oversized, I'm still in that window. So I have my front spacing at 15 and a half wide and my back spacing at 20 and a half wide. I measured in between the two and got a measurement and then I added an inch and a half to that because these mortises turned out to be three quarters of an inch deep. So you have to add an inch and a half to that to get the right um, width. So those measurements came to, I need 16 inch rails for the sides, I'm going to need 8 of those. I need 13 and a half inch rails for the front, and I need 10 of those since I have that extra one for the drawer. So I'm going to put my cross cut sled on my table saw, put a, a, a stop on there, and cut all these pieces. I think I have enough of the lumber I have, I'll have to be pretty smart about how I cut it in order to get all those pieces. To cut all these tenons, there's going to be 36 of them. I'm going to be using my tenoning jig. It rides along my fence, it props the piece vertically, and it cuts slices into it. And then once that's done, I hand cut this, the shoulders off this one, but I'll probably put a miter gauge on here and slice them off. This jig works exceptionally well. I'm, it took like 20 minutes to make. Um, I don't recall if I have a video making this jig on my channel. Um, the basics of it you can see are that there's a cradle on here that fits my fence with a handle that slides. If you don't know how to make one of those, you can look at my jointing video. Uh, the jointing jig is made a similar way. And then it's just a vertical piece of wood screwed to that. And you have to make sure that this is square to your tabletop. And then there's a stop back here that's square to that screw to that vertical piece, as well as this replaceable piece. That's why there's bolts in it that hold your stock square and perpendicular to the fence top. And it's bolted in because you can replace it over time because it will get marks in it. So then I want three quarter inch tenons. So all I had to do was raise my raise my blade to three quarters. And you could see with the test piece I tried how it will slide across there and cut two perfect grooves to make that tenon. So for that, all I did was, since this is, I made these specifically an inch and a quarter, so I could have a quarter inch shoulder on each side. So I just came in a quarter on each side and eyed it up on here and slid it through until I got it perfect. And then once this is set, you could just run them all through. Now I had to move this to um, use my cross cutting sled, so I'm going to take a piece of scrap and even though I reset this up with my test piece, I'm going to run it through, hand cut the shoulders and make sure it fits in my mortises just before I cut all these to make sure it's perfect. So that test feet piece fit in there perfectly. It's snug. I used a little mallet to tap it in, which is exactly what you want. You obviously don't want it too loose, but you also don't want to have to beat um, it into submission. So that fits in there nicely. So now I have my stack over there and I can just run each one through, do both ends. And then um, I'll set up my miter, miter gauge and lower my blade and clip off the ends because you could see you could cut them by hand but that's just going to take way too long.
I dry fitted that first frame together and I couldn't be happier with it. It's rigid and structural and holds itself together even before any glues on the joints and that's kind of what I strive for with these pieces. So I'm going to do the second one as well and then move on from there. But I think one of the big, one of the things I'm most happy about which I wasn't going to tell how well it was until I put this together is just how flush everything is. My front's nice and flush. How square everything is. There's no big gaps in the tenons. They go in there squarely and that is invaluable when building something like this. If you've ever done mortise and tenon joinery or um, more in-depth joinery for any sort of building if your jig cuts your mortises off square, if your tenons are cut off square, none of this lines up and it really turns into a nightmare. And if you're making 36 mortises and 36 tenons and each one's off a little bit, the problem just gets expounded over time and your furniture will be severely compromised. So now that this is together, I can fully endorse that mortising jig. It worked out awesome. I'm going to start on my second one. The one drawback to that jig, it, which is something you'll experience unless you have a slot mortiser, that is since your router is going to leave these as an oval and your table saw cuts these as square, you really only have two options. You can either square off your mortise or round off your tenons. Now, for squaring off the mortises, they sell a chisel that's made for squaring off mortises. I don't have one of those, so I can't really attest to the valuableness of it. But out of the two options with the chisels I do have, I find that rounding off the tenons is faster and easier. So that is what I did for that entire piece. I filmed the process, but basically what I do is when it's vertical, I take a very sharp knife and take off most of the bulk of the corners, then I take a rasp, which is a very aggressive file, and start rounding off the corners, and then with a finer file, usually right about here is where it's hard to get to, I use that to round off the pieces until you get just about a perfect oval, and then this whole thing will fit together. I have those frames together, everything's square, everything's sitting level. I'm really happy with how they turned out. Um, the burn marks on the wood, I'm gonna, the burn marks on the wood I'll address at some point. And honestly, since the customer wants this to be distressed and there's gonna be some staining involved in this, I might not um, worry too much about those, but I'll kind of tackle that when I get to the finished part. Um, the only thing I messed up on, and you could, you might have saw it in the video, is at one point I placed one of my pieces in my jig the wrong way and cut a mortise um, on the opposite side. So fortunately when I made that test tenon, I have a perfect filler. I could plug that, chop, cut this off and plug that and you won't know the wiser because it's on the inside of the piece. You won't see it, but I still want to plug it.
So now what I'm going to start tackling are the two sides. The back is going to have a metal panel and it's going to be up against the wall. You're not going to see it. The two sides are going to be old barnwood that I got from Lancaster. And like I said, the fronts, the customer hasn't fully decided what they want. So these are the two pieces of old barnwood. You can see they're fairly weathered. So because over the years these weathered differently, the edges of them are thicker or thinner depending on what part they fall on the piece. So you can see on that side they're about 5 eighths of an inch, but on this side they're about a half inch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the, the medium average of what I have, which is 5 eighths of an inch. I cut a 5 eighths of an inch groove on both sides around this whole piece. You want those panels to float in there similarly to how you would make a door. Seasonal temperature changes and humidity will cause this whole thing to expand and contract. If you have those panels floating in there and not glued in place, they can move freely, they won't crack, and the whole piece will be much more structural. So I'm going to cut a whole groove in there, and since these aren't wide enough, I'll have to put a center partition, but then I could slap those in there. The parts that are a little thick, so if this side's 5 eighths of an inch, but if it gets to three quarters on the back, I could just plane it down a little bit to get it to fit into space. Before I take everything apart, I put X's on either ends of the upsides as well as on the insides of where those dados will go with yellow marks on that rougher wood. There's going to be a lot of pieces to cut and they're all going to be coming apart and you don't want to be cutting these on the wrong side. So it's just easier to have that visual marker before you slide all the pieces through the saw. all my grooves through the pieces of cherry and it's going to cut into your tenon but the piece of barn wood's going to run up to your tenon to reinforce it. So now it's time to cut into the barn wood legs and for that I lined up my dado blade to cut right below where that tenon is. To make sure I had it set up accurately I just put a little mark in it and then put the pieces in and you could see that it lines up so that piece can run continuously around those grooves. Now since I don't want to go through the whole piece, I put two pieces of tape on either side of my dado stack so I know that I could set it down on that mark, run it through, and when my tail end gets to the edge of this mark, I can lift it up and I'll only cut through here. There might be a little bit of chiseling work to do, but in general it's going to give me a nice groove. So all of those side grooves are cut and you probably noticed about halfway through the video I stopped relying on the tape and that's because since the bottom legs come up higher than the groove on the top, if I wasn't sending them through the same way, um, those tape marks didn't matter and the tape was getting caught up in the jig. So I was just eyeing it with where the mortises were and that worked out fine. Some of them ended up a little bit long. but you won't be able to see that in the finished piece. Also when I was doing the cherry I took a scrap piece I had and put the exact same dados on two sides of it so now I could cut this into pieces and use it for my center partitions. I mocked one of my sides back up with the grooves and you could see how it's a continuous channel around the whole piece which is really important if this is off the grooves are off um, when you go to put that barn wood in there, it's not going to line up. So now to get my middle partition, I thought I could get away with just putting a groove on one side. I cut that long piece I had in half, so I have two sections, but I need four. So what I'm going to do now is split this down the middle and put two more grooves on it. The middle will be pretty thin, but this isn't necessarily a structural piece. It's just kind of to help um, 
with expansion of contraction of those panels and it will be grooved into the top and bottom as well. I reset up my dado stack the exact same way I had the first time. I measured the depth and the distance off of the originals and I cut those. And like I said, that middle partition is pretty thin, but since this is such thick cherry, there's no give or anything to it. It's pretty solid. Ideally, I would have left this middle part a little bit thicker. These are half inch grooves. I probably would have made them a quarter inch, but I was being a little hasty and trying to cut everything on the dado stack without having to switch back into it. Um, luckily, it, I could roll with this. It's not going to compromise the structure of the piece, but like I said, um, ideally if you're doing this, I would make this partition a little bit thicker. So then I put all my slides back together and I measured this opening and they're all um, 16 and 3 quarters, which is great. That means I could cut all of these the same. So since they're 16 and 3 quarters and my grooves are a half inch, I'm going to cut all of these to 17 and 3 quarters like this. And then I'll come up a half inch on either side and trim off this top and this thicker back side. And then this little groove will stick into this groove, be glued into place, and then the whole thing will be continuous rectangles. I could cut that barn board up and, and start sizing it in the pieces. So to cut these so I don't have to take my stack out, I'm probably going to cut these on my chop saw all down to 17 and 3 quarters. Then I'll set up a miter gauge and um, I'm going to have to change it out twice since these two pieces are thicker and cut a half inch into here. that divider and all my pieces and that's what it's going to look like. It's actually going to be flipped. That fat side is going to be on the inside but that's how it's going to look. So then what I did was I found center on both of these and it was I think 14 and 5 8 across. So center was 7 and 5 16 and then I found center of this piece. I measured the two pieces that are exactly three, um, six and three quarters wide on either side, as well as they're still 16 and three quarters long. So I'm not going to be cutting these to fit perfectly into these grooves. You want a little bit of space, breather room around all of them so they can expand. So um, it should be, it's 16 and 3 quarters, that means that half inch on either side would bring me to 17 and 3 quarters. But I'm going to be cutting it more so on like a heavy 17 and a half, 17 and 5 eighths. And then the same with the bottom, 6 and 3 quarters. It should be 7 and 3 quarters, but I'm going to do the same thing about 7 and a half, 7 and 5 eighths to give me some room to play with on there. fit one of those panels together and this is what it's going to look like and since I fit this together and I um, saw that those sizes are right I went and just made um, two stacks because I'm going to need three more to finish these up and I simply in the video you can see I rip it down to the width I need and then I use my cross cutting sled to slice them to the 17 and 5 eighths I think it was and it was nice because the edge of my cross cutting sled was exactly what I needed so I just lined these up with the edge of the cross cutting sled and just kept sending them through. Now 
I'm going to take this apart and show you what I had to do to get these in there. Because of the different widths and the fact that they curve so much, what I ended up doing was putting my dado stack back in my fence and I've been trimming the edges of these to get them to fit. I've been taking off probably about an eighth of an inch took this one out so you could see it. So the one side that wasn't super thick, you could see I only took off about a sixteenth of an inch. But at the curve parts with the severe curve, I've been taking off a, about an eighth. On this one long side that was about three quarters, I took off about an eighth. And the same thing on this edge. And I've just been using my eye to figure it out. But you can see how there's a bump here. So I was taking off more at this edge than the other edge. Now that might seem like it's hard to do. But you could see how these rest on there. They rock. So as you raise your blade. I've been making sure to hold them down and they'll end up naturally taking off the thickness you want. I'm going to film doing that. It kind of sounds like it doesn't make much sense. But So this is a little more time consuming, but I knew I was going to have to do something just because of the irregular irregularities of this wood. But once I had this set up, it it's kind of becomes a much quicker process. So after that first pass, my edges look like they're a perfect thickness, and you could see how it takes off those high spots and leaves this at somewhat of a uniform thickness. So there's my stack of sides, and I'd like to stack stuff like this because you'll see if they're all still the same width and the same height, just um, is kind of a double check for the fact that they're going to work out. So now what I'm going to do is glue these together, and I need three clamps per panel, so I think I can only glue together three, two or three at a time. I'll have to see how that goes. But basically what I'm going to do is I'm only going to put glue on my mortise and tenons and then on that little uh, piece that goes into this side. Anything that touches the panel you don't want glue on. You want this to freely float in space. That's kind of the whole point of spending all that time making those grooves and fitting these panels into place. <laughs> 